Okay, so, so, so broadly speaking, what happens is the way the Azizid story was sold, if you look at, um, so, okay, let's take a step back. Uh, export promotion zones in India have had a long history, right? We are the second country to get export promotion zone, and Kandla was among the earliest in the way back in the 60s. Um, so, we had about seven of them, and these, these are important to worry about because of something else that will come to later. But broadly speaking, uh, there's been this story about zones where you could do some exports um, and largely got to do with taxes and benefits and things of that sort. When the SEZ story or SEZ story came up in 2005, brought to parliament, before that there was already since 2000 a certain number of SEZ which sort of came up. Uh, not too many of them, but if I remember right, around uh, slightly over 10. So um, during that space of the act, um, and then they brought legislation in Parliament. Now the justification for that legislation in 2005, if you look at the speech by the Minister for Commerce, essentially says SEZs are not about exports, they're about employment. So, uh, and which I think was the perfectly sensible justification to provide. But if you look at the details of that scheme, what happened is the only thing that is measured uh, is exports. And the only regulatory criteria that you have is that the net foreign exports of, from a particular SEZ needs to be positive. So in terms of reporting and structures, if you get the data from the Ministry of Commerce, you'll find that you'll find much more data available for how much is being exported from different SEZs, rather than how many people are employed within a given SEZ. And because the Minister's speech and the thrust of that narrative was largely about employment, the initial claims about SEZ said that we'll have X million people employed in these spaces in, the in a relatively short period of time, and you'll, they'd say that they, they will then create X more indirect levels of employment and things of that sort. Some of those claims were actually quite uh, laughable, especially if you start off from the beginning, because you had a tiny ACZ near Chandigarh called Quark, uh, which um, purported that it would actually end up employing about 50,000 odd people and then create. 10 times more jobs in the uh, indirect employment, sort of almost half a million jobs in that area. The, of course, since then, uh, Quark never did take off and we don't really have any jobs there at the moment. But um, those kinds of patently uh, ludicrous claims aside, um, there really wasn't a particularly strong measurement story around labor. So, the government was saying that the SEZ was about employment, but they didn't really move in that direction. The second story is they said SEZ was about manufacturing. And uh, India was you know, much the same stuff that you're hearing now under the Make in India campaign. Um, very low manufacturing numbers, we need spaces where they could come in, do a lot of manufacturing and so on. Uh, an ex post, however, very little of that has been realized. Um, you sometimes will hear stories which will say, uh, if you look at the uh, numbers on uh, manufacturing, um, exports, most of the manufacturing exports that are currently happening from the SEZs are SEZs that were established before the act. And uh, one particular SEZ, uh, which exports almost 40% of the total uh, exports from SEZs, uh, which is the Reliance Petroleum Refinery in Jamra. Um, so the problem uh, at that point in time was there was one other characteristic that needed to be satisfied if you're really going into employment and into manufacturing visit uh, the character of additionality. Right. Would this have happened where the SEZ policy not to be there? Right. Uh, is it simply a factory that would have come up anyway 
but is now coming in inside an SEZ and stuff outside it. Uh, and what you, uh, for example, it's very hard to argue the Reliance Jamnagar refinery would not have come up without an SEZ because it was already in construction at the time the policy came into place. Uh, so, consequently, basically based on the tenets of their own policy, um, what you now find if you look at the uh, composition of exports from SEZs is that almost, um, uh, if you want the numbers, I'll just pull them up for you. Um, Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, broadly speaking, what you have is a situation where um, if you're looking at uh, most of the uh, exports from, uh, let's say there are three kinds of SEZs that you can uh, sort of characterize. One would be uh, the Central Act, which means it's been done the first seven and so on and so forth, and then the ones which happened between 2005 and 2000, 2000 and 2005, and the rest which sort of happened after the act. And the amount of uh, manufacturing that happens um, from SEZs that have been established after the act is minuscule. Right? Uh, because most of the export that's happening from SEZs after the act, uh, post-2005, which has been created, are essentially IT exports. Uh, this makes sense because around the time that this was happening, uh, India, in order to comply with a variety of WTO commitments, had to take away the kind of um, export subsidies, uh, relief from taxes, etc., that IT firms were getting. So, as a result, they needed to create a space where IT firms would continue to get similar kinds of benefits. And the SEZs, given the kinds of commitments made to the WTO, were spaces where that, those kinds of commitments could be continued. So IT firms operating out of an SEZ could get benefits similar to what they got earlier without operating in an SEZ. Uh, it was a regulatory story. You know, it's not a political story internally. So you don't have to sell the st story internally, you have to sell that story depending on the kinds of legal commitments you had made under your trade agreements. But would that, I mean, why would it be okay for an SEZ and not for a... Uh, because the, uh, a lot of the WTO agreements allow you for uh, certain benefits to be provided in places like special economic zones mm -hmm. that you do not provide more widely, especially for uh, less developed countries and so on. They allow you certain spaces of exception uh, from these kinds of commitments. And uh, in this case, this is what they uh, were able to provide in that particular direction. Right? So uh, it, therefore, what you had is a situation where uh, these places became almost entirely um, relatively small exceeds. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the distribution of SEZs, of the small SEZs, most of them were small and came up around the large cities. And when I say small, uh, sort of take it less than one square kilometer, but actually most of them were less than 10 acres, right? uh, which is the minimum size of that particular uh, 10 hectares, uh, which is the minimum <coughs> size of that particular story. Which then brings us to a very interesting problem because um, one of the big issues around SEZs against which a lot of the popular movement was organized was land. Uh, and there was a lot of appropriation of land for the uh, variety of SEZs. Uh, and in many cases, uh, Mundra, uh, for example, in Gujarat, Tosco uh, in uh, Orissa, um, the uh, Nandigram story in um, Bengal, again, which essentially overturned an entire political um, structure uh, in West Bengal. Uh, 
um, and uh, many other large places, Mangalore, as you said, most of which uh, have been documented fairly carefully in a project that um, uh, one worked with, with a number of collaborators and uh, with Lorraine Kennedy and Rob Jenkins uh, over a period of what, three, four years, um, which basically shows that a lot of the protest movement uh, against ACZs in India was driven around the politics of land. But if you look at the outcomes, uh, and you look at, let's say, numbers for 2011-12, you're looking at a situation where about 85% um, of exports from SEZs happen from about 7% of the land. And you get to 7% of the land because uh, Reliance Jamnagar refinery does about 40% of exports and takes about 3 or 4% of the land. The rest of it is all IT. So all this fight over land essentially led to a lot of alienation, led to a lot of political protest, might have led to a changeover in governments at various places, but it did not produce any outcome in terms of actual manufacturing or actual exports of any other kind of services. So even politically, it was a bad fight to fight because you upset a lot of people without getting too much benefit unless the control of the land itself was the benefit that you're looking for. And that may well be the case. So you have that particular structure, whereas an, a large number of SEZs now since 2008 and 2009 when the slowdown has happened, uh, you've had a large number of uh, situations where the developers have come and said, let us change the land use, let us take the land back, and we have, because in many cases where developers have purchased the land, they would now like to change it for different uses. And Maharashtra recently approved a policy which said that you can now move into industrial parks, into residential stories, etc. Uh, so that's one part of the story. The other part of the story with respect to land and manufacturing is if you speak to developers like, say, uh, Mahindra's, who operate this large uh, space uh, outside of Chennai, uh, which has both an SEZ space as well as a non-SEZ space. What you find is that uh, the SEZ space is occupied disproportionately by IT firms. And even manufacturers who do export, and now in and uh, around Chennai there are a lot of manufacturing exports, especially in auto components and stuff like that, those manufacturers don't want to be in the SEZ because the regulations that govern the coming in and coming out of structures and making sure that you don't attract duty, if you want to be a firm which is selling both in the domestic market and in the export market, you are not somebody who wants to be inside an SEZ because the regulatory burden becomes too high. Right? So this brings me back to the original point. India had a lot of bureaucratic experience with export promotion zones. India wanted, if the minister is to be believed, to create an infrastructure for employment. But because a lot of the baggage from export promotion was carried over, and because in the eyes of the Ministry of Finance and the others, these tax concessions that were being given were not tax concessions to secure <coughs> employment, but tax concessions to secure exports. You had a situation where a very onerous regulatory system was put in place, which may have actually significantly eroded the employment story in a relatively futile bid to keep up the export story. And the export story which did happen was exports of IT, exports of petroleum, which was uh, essentially driven by the fact that the domestic market was not open for petroleum sales because of subsidized uh, 
tariffs in the domestic market and so Reliance uses entire refining capacity to import and export petroleum and uh, exports from pre-existing SEZs which already had a certain amount of infrastructure. So if you look at the last 15 years or so, which if you take 2000 as a break point now, a lot of the story about SEZ has been much ado about nothing. That's the broad thrust of that story. Recently, what you do have is a situation where in response to the fact that not much has been happening, um, there is a situation where they're saying, uh, let's look at the flaws in the policy. And some of the flaws in the policy were some of these regulatory structures, in the fact that a certain amount had to be processing, non-processing, and I'll come back to one of those issues in a minute. So two kinds of broad policy flaws were identified. Uh, one flaw was that, as I said, many of them were too small. Can we have larger SEZs? Uh, look, look at China, they started off with this huge SEZs kind of story. And the second flaw uh, was the fact that uh, these were seen as not cities, that they needed to have ancillary facilities, etc., etc. And the original policy, in order to ensure that SEZs were not land used for real estate development, uh, had limited the amount of area that could be used for non-manufacturing activities. <coughs> so they tried to make changes in that particular policy. Um, in the uh, size story, they have now come up with special investment regions. In some places, there is this industrial corridors. But frank, hopefully, uh, most of these is not about large land acquisition. The first major one, which is sort of going on stream in terms, which seems to be have the backing of this government, the new one, uh, seems to be the uh, initiative in Tolera to create a particular city. There, the narrative at least is that the land uh, assembly process has largely been through a process of uh, land pooling, which is not so much acquisition. Uh, the extent to which that is uh, accurate and the beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries there need to be examined. Uh, the second issue is the one of uh, SEZ the cities. Um, while there has been a fair amount of relaxation in the policy, it hasn't really taken off because obviously the demand for real estate uh, dropped sharply in the last few years after the global crisis. Uh, and more importantly also because there really never was much attention paid to how would these SEZs be governed as non-industrial spaces. Who would be the people who would actually govern this area? In the case, of, let's say, of the Mahindra World City that we're talking about, almost for the entire length of the existence, they were not clear as to whether their governance arrangements would be with the panchayat under whose lands they came in, or there would be a separate governance arrangement put together in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and in many other places, uh, like in Andhra Pradesh and in Rajasthan, uh, they have worked the governance arrangements through the industrial area authorities, the industrial development corporations. Um, Gujarat was the only state which had a clear governance mechanism. And the governance mechanism was that the SEZ would be run by a triumvirate, which is the a representative of the developer, a representative of the state government, and a representative of the union government. Okay. Uh, completely non-representative in terms of a space from which local democracy was being taken away. Uh, it's curious because in China, the process around that time was how do you expand spaces of local democracy? And in India, the story was exactly the opposite, that we are taking away local democracy from certain places. Uh, but at least on the positive side, the Gujarat story was a clear story. And then in Associate, they had a variety of town planning structures that they put in place, um, which gave them um, structures about how these things were going to be run. Um, but in most other places, there still is not enough clarity about how these spaces would be run. Uh, 
And in many places, the issue is moot because they said if it is essentially a plot of about 10 hectares or thereabouts, uh, it doesn't really require very much of a governance story. So that's where the uh, structure sort of comes into play. So the SEZs and as a form of urbanization uh, or as a kickstarter to urbanization or a new form of industrial space uh, is was not really something that also took off. As of now, perhaps you have three large spaces, I would say, where there is some form of this kind of stuff happening. There is the Mundra, uh, the Adani SEZ in Mundra, which given the closeness of the uh, promoter with this particular government, I would expect that thing to do, uh, move on further. You'd have um, another space called Sri City, which is just outside Chennai, uh, which is again a large space, about uh, 3,000 or so. And then you have a space, which is a textile stuff at Brandex uh, Park around um, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, around Vishakapatnam, in the Kakinada area. Uh, and there are a couple of other uh, public sector SEZs which have a certain amount of size. But otherwise, there are really no large enough spaces which require governance authorities in that sense. Right? Because those kinds of spaces just never got developed. Um, so that's where uh, that structure holds. So net, what you have if you're looking at the ACZ policy and you say, what is its legacy? Um, I suppose one legacy which can be called to some extent progressive uh, is perhaps the amendment to our land acquisition legislation. Uh, we had an act from 1894 uh, which focused on landowners had relatively limited compensation. Um, in 2013, you had the combination of the Land Acquisition and Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act. Uh, it's actually called the Right to Fair Compensation. It's a long, nice name, but let's stick with the functional name. And what uh, you've had there is one large philosophical shift, which is that you've included non-landowners project affected people, so to speak, um, as part of the compensation package. Uh, and there has been another instrumental change in the sense that uh, the amount of compensation uh, is now more closely linked to the alternative value of the land than the land in its previous use, which is what the principle was used in the previous act. Both these are relatively progressive advancements. There has been some, uh, there's been a lot of pushback and some dilution of these advancements as a result of the recent ordinance. We have to see whether that gets uh, institutionalized into legislation. Uh, but uh, in some senses, the, this change in our land acquisition legal framework may not have come about without the widespread protests against land that in part or in substantial measure were actually driven uh, by the SEZ policy and the uh, very dispersed nature of land acquisition which brought a lot of communities together across the country. So uh, if you're looking at a hopeful note on which to end the SEZ story, uh, it could perhaps be the fact that uh, you're looking at uh, a much better way of compensations for land acquisitions now than we had before this that story started. Uh, and the second benefit is perhaps the understanding that these kinds of small spaces of exception are not a particularly viable way to increase manufacturing in the country and you need changes in things like a variety of other policies uh, which this government and the Make in India campaign, uh, I hope, will understand and not limit its efforts only to creating larger species of exception like the corridors and the special investment.
the, 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 the Chinese story is, um, they used SEZ in very different ways, mm. right? Um, because when China started its SEZ uh, in the early um, part of its industrialization process, they were really worried because for about 30 years, China had been cut off from a market economy. And while they knew that there was a very strong market system within China before that period, they weren't sure how much of those skills actually still existed. So they created these five spaces in very lucrative spots, right across from Hong Kong, right across from Taiwan, and so on and so forth, <coughs> with a view to try and understand whether those skills in some sense existed. Could the Chinese still work and participate in a market economy? And they found out through the initial period of about 10 years or so, that not only was there a lot of investment willing to come in into these spaces, because remember at that time, the only place where foreign investors could invest in China were these spaces. So obviously, any foreign interest was concentrated in these spaces. And they found out that the Chinese seemed to be doing just fine. They hadn't really forgotten. It's like bicycling, even if you haven't done it for 30 years, you just get up on a bike and start pedaling again. Once they realized that, then this whole idea of spaces of exception actually went away. Because they moved very rapidly to something called 14 open port cities, and then they caused these large open regions where they basically took the ACZ like policies and said it can happen everywhere. Because the ACZ's policies were largely market friendly regulations, limited to specific areas because they weren't sure what the effect is. Once they realized that the effects were not very disruptive, they just extended it all over the place. And places which were able to provide the infrastructure and the labor required to take advantage of these policies prospered rapidly. So, however, I think Indians, because partly of, maybe because of our EPZ experience, <coughs> but partly because we're used to thinking of these bypasses rather than actually confronting real reform, we focused on the initial idea of, oh, they had these little spaces where they did certain things and completely forgot about this large expansion that took place uh, in SEZ type policies across the space. And that's where uh, I think um, we lost the plot in not understanding what is it that we should have been learning from the Chinese uh, as opposed to what we purported to learn.